same, same here, same in Krakow. Same in Vienna. <laughs> Okej, okay. dobry wieczór Państwu. Zacznę po polsku. Chciałam Państwa serdecznie przywitać w imieniu Narodowego Instytutu Architektury i Urbanistyki na kolejnym już wydarzeniu online towarzyszącym wystawie Antropocen. Tym razem debata, spotkanie pod tytułem Architektura Radykalnej Troski. Debatę będzie moderować Dorota Leśna-Krychlak, która jest redaktorką naczelną kwartalnika Autoportret, Pismo o dobrej przestrzeni oraz założycielką i prezeską Fundacji Instytutu Architektury. W rozmowie udział weźmie także Elkę Krasny, która jest z kolei urbanistką, teoretyczką architektury oraz kuratorką, w tym między innymi znana jest jako współkuratorka wystawy, wystawy o, o, takim, o, o właśnie tej tematyce, którą się zajmuje, czyli, czyli jejku. Właśnie, krytykę, dziękuję, Dorota, bo szukałam <laughs> dokładnie po oryginalnym krytyku um, architektura radykalnej troski, tak? Um, obie panie, zresztą i zarówno Dorota, jak i Elka są autorkami tekstów do katalogu wystawy, który, którego premiera odbędzie się już 24 listopada w pawilonie Zodiak, w miejscu, gdzie wystawa będzie otwarta do 27 listopada, więc zapraszamy też Państwa przy tej okazji na inne wydarzenia towarzyszące, zarówno te realizowane w formie online, jak jak i te stacjonarne, takie również jeszcze poza premierą katalogu odbędą się w pawilonie Zodiak. Z kwestii technicznych zapraszamy, zachęcamy Państwa do zadawania pytań, czy też dzielenia się refleksjami, czy przemyśleniami w toku tej, w te, w toku tej rozmowy pod transmisją na YouTubie. Może zostawać właśnie te pytania, czy też myśli zarówno w języku polskim, jak i angielskim. Będziemy je przekazywać do, do moderatorki i będą one włączane w dyskusję. Tak jak Państwo pewnie już wiecie z informacji na temat tego wydarzenia, całość będzie prowadzona w języku angielskim i dlatego teraz już przejdę na język angielski i też przywitam, czy powtórzę te informacje w języku angielskim, następnie oddam głos już Dorocie. So now I'll switch, I'll switch to English and I would like to, good evening, I would like to welcome you on behalf of National Institute of Architecture and Urban Planning to the, to the online event which is a part of the program for the Anthropocene exhibition uh, which is uh, which is presented uh, at the uh, Zodiac Pavilion in Warsaw till uh, 27th of November uh, so if you are <laughs> if you are from Poland or not we are inviting you uh, till the end or till, till uh, 27th of November to visit uh, this exhibition uh, this panel will be moderated by Dorota Leśniak Rychlak who is uh, uh, editor-in-chief of Autoportret Pismo Dobrej Przestrzeni, and also founder and, uh, uh, and uh, chair of the Institute of Architecture Foundation. Um, uh, this panel uh, is with participation of Elke Krasny, urban planner, uh, theoretician of architecture and, uh, and curator, known, uh, for instance, as a co-curator co -curator of, a, of a, a critical care architecture and urbanism for Broken Planet exhibition, and also a catalog um, published under the same title. Uh, Elka will also uh, will give us today a short presentation. Uh, both ladies, Dorota and Elka, are authors of uh, texts uh, that are um, uh, included in the Anthropocene exhibition catalogue, uh, which uh, will be published also in English, if you would like, would be interested. Um, as you probably already know, this whole event, whole panel will be conducted in English, uh, but we encourage you to ask questions uh, as well in Polish or in English under the broadcast on YouTube. And we will share it uh, to the uh, moderator, Dorota uh, leśna Krychlak. And now I give the lead to the moderator and uh, Dorota, this is, your, this is your turn. <laughs> Thank you very much, Marta, for the kind introduction. And I'm really honored and very pleased to host um, uh, a meeting with Elke Krasny, whose work uh, was very, uh, inspirational for us and also portrait for many issues already. Uh, and I would like to start with this very general uh, sort of diagnostical questions. Uh, questions since we uh, more or less know that, uh, that uh, our planet is in danger and, and the climate catastrophe is looming, we don't always realize 
what part of this problem is uh, is architecture, uh, contemporary architecture. So I would like to start with this uh, diagnosis question, what causes the major distractions in, in terms of uh, production of contemporary architecture? Well, first of all, good evening to, to everyone and, and, and thank you so much for, for the kind invitation and in particular to, to the kind correspondence with Marta and, and that Dorota, um, with whom I had the pleasure to, to be in private conversation before and also in conversations about contributing to Autoportrait, which was uh, mentioned before, that you are conducting and moderating this public conversation now. Um, so speaking of the planet in danger and architecture as endangering the planet and also being part of, if you will, healing the, the planet. So, so in a way, both paradoxically is maybe one of the most complex challenges that, that we are facing today. I, I guess I would like to, um, to start thinking about this with observations on, on scale. I, I think it is extremely difficult for um, human beings um, to understand since the year 2000, when the term Anthropocene became fully popularized and um, the stratigraphic commission started to work on understanding whether we really are in a new geological epoch or not, that, that humans have now defined um, a, a change from the Holocene to the Anthropocene and have to understand how not all humans, but a specific um, type of human, um, a type of human that thought that um, nature can be exploited and the planet is a never ending resource at the command of humans, that these humans are a geological force. So, so what does that mean that human beings have changed the planet in such a way that the planet might become uninhabitable? I think that's extremely difficult to grasp. And at the same time, living through the pandemic, humans are also challenged to understand how microbial they actually are. So, so that in, inside our bodies, what's going on is the other end of this scale, which is very much linked to the anthropogenic, the man-made condition. And I think these scales, the, the bacterial microbial scale and the planetary scale that intersect in how human beings live with their planet and architecture is a, a huge part of how we inhabit um, this planet together is very, very difficult um, to, to grasp in order to understand new orientations for what architecture does. I guess looking back now at modern architecture makes us understand that the narrative around modern architecture, regardless where it took place on, on the planet, uh, in, regardless whether it, it, it was built in the global south or in the global north or in the former east or in the former west, um, had this promise of building a better world. So, so there was this unbroken relationship to future making, that architecture was going to make the future modern, if, if, if you will. And I think now coming to realize as people who produce architecture and, and plan cities um, that precisely this production was part of what you called putting the planet in danger and learning how to understand this past differently, but learning from this past how, how to actually build differently. Um, I think is one of the most crucial challenges because statistically, um, the, not, not architecture with capital A necessarily, but the building and construction industry causes 40% um, of CO2 emissions and is therefore very much um, one of the main causes of putting the, the planet um, in danger. So, so I guess from a more theoretical perspective, it's about architecture being part of this problem in order to make, so learning from that in order to develop different solutions. 
Um, and I think there are many different ways of contributing to that. Um, architecture schools, policymakers, um, working across uh, architects, developers, um, industry. So I don't think one can ever think that it will be the task of a few activists to save the planet. I, I, I think it's really if there is going to be habitability instead of inhabitability, it needs alliances between forces that historically have been um, deemed at co in conflict with each other. Yeah. Maybe I'll stop uh, here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so before we move to your presentation, uh, I would like to perhaps switch for a, to a more personal note, knowing your work and also knowing that, uh, you know, as climate catastrophe is this hyper object, as Timothy Morton put it, and it really like overwhelms us. So we tend to like that there is a whole huge movement of dwelling in some kind of dystopias about the future. The other not necessarily strategy, but just attitude is, is just to, to give up or to ignore it. And I, I would like to ask, how do you mobilize yourself to, to or organize yourself to, to, to action, to act and to try to, uh, I don't know, not perhaps be optimist, but to somehow uh, manage to hope for, for, for better? Hmm. I think this is really one of the most crucial questions um, people ask of themselves. But I think maybe the most important thing is how to ask such questions collectively and to answer them collectively. So I guess the trap of neoliberalism is this hyper individuality that one person alone will have to become the master slash mistress of their own lives. Um, and not making the interdependency of lived lives the, the center of where, let's say, hope um, or optimism can, can actually um, be generated. The, the last years I've been working a lot with um, air theory and understanding better what this complex and difficult um, activity of care means. And at the same time, um, I have um, children who are now, let's say, all taller than me. And, um, and I would say, from the personal experience of having been a parent, I also know a lot about care. I mean, so I haven't just been reading, I've also been living with this um, practice. And so if we take care to be a specific form of knowledge that brings feeling and thinking together really closely, which is something that um, modernity, Western modernity hasn't really taught us so much about, then we also understand how close worry and hope are to each other. So, so when one cares, one worries easily um, about other people, about their condition, about um, things that may go wrong about illnesses. And at the same time, while worrying, I think one also always seeks to maintain hope that, that things um, provided through care and produced together will actually maybe not always necessarily make things better, but at least not make things worse. Um, and, and I guess, Personally, that's how I would approach it, that worry and hope are so closely linked with each other. And I don't think this is the vocabulary that, um, or maybe I'm generalizing, but I guess from what I know, this is not the vocabulary used in most architecture schools. So, 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 so we do not uh, start a new program or the semester with the first years. By, by speaking with the students about their personal worries and their planetary hopes and their planetary worries and their personal hopes, so and so on and so forth. So how architecture actually acts within the production of worry and hope is not is not the way in which this is spoken about. And, and I think finding and other language in order to imagine architecture differently is just as important as 
finding other materials, um, other ways of zoning and land use, um, other ways of re-inhabiting and reuse. So I think there's so, so many things that, that start with imagining something differently and, and precisely bringing, a, let's say, more everyday or more mundane vocabulary in order to make things not simpler but more complex is is maybe one of the ways in which we could uh, generate um, agency. And the other thing is at the level of education, which is where I invest most of my time um, as as a professional, um, to allow for working together and not romanticizing this. I mean, working together is very often much more complicated than working alone. Um, so, so building how working together um, horizontally, not, not with um, following um, commands from above, um, can actually generate what you asked about, how, how one can sustain um, agency to be motivated to get up again every morning. So a lot of disability theorists and, and CRIP scholars, they speak about what, what it takes to A, work from bed or motivate oneself to get up. Or So, so I think um, this, uh, this movement um, of not necessarily getting up if that is impossible for bodies, but not giving up, I think that's, that's the most... Um, important thing this despite of everything so so not naively ignoring any of the catastrophes that are going on but but not allowing them to take over the the kinds of uh, mental and spiritual and emotional and intellectual resiliences that we can find together with others yeah definitely especially when you said about addressing the worries in terms of students i i know Quite many people who are graduates and 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 facing the reality are really depressed. Uh, but of, but also the the question was not addressed in the school in the first place. So it was somehow, you know, business as usual and and the the the, the ordinary <laughs> not maybe ordinary but but just the the classical term, discipline and, and production of architecture. Uh, perhaps but, we will now, yeah. No, no, I was just wondering, I mean, so in a way, when, when we first talked about this, it was more a conversation, and then you said if I could share some images, but I really liked the conversation, I just wanted to say, we can also stay with the conversation. <laughs> no, no, I, but, I, but I really wanted, because you know what, what, what happened when I shared that I uh, will be in this discussion today, uh, that somebody re read the article I linked and said, yeah, it's, it's very everything is very like uh, uh, appropriate in terms of diagnosis, but then the positions are uh, sort of so general that it, that it becomes vague. It was somebody who was asking from inside the profession, uh, an urbanist. And so I thought that actually when, when we have this presentation now and you can uh, share also the examples you used in the exhibition, Mm -hmm. then I think it gets more sort of real in terms of what it means uh, uh, facing the reality and what it mm -hmm. means in practice. Because, because this is, I think, also something which uh, eventually builds us up in terms of, uh, you know, continuing the efforts. Mm -hmm. uh, so so I, I, think, I think it would be just great <laughs> if you can, uh, if you, we switch to the conversation and then the, the presentation and then we will still have some time and we also encourage the viewers uh, for questions uh, So uh, after. So please do. Okay, so I'll-, I'll It's a beautiful be, presentation. So. <laughs> I'll try to be quick and, and I hope we can um, generate some, um, concreteness through through this so um so so in a way your questions were leading into this what 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 does it mean to live with the um, anthropocene condition and how can architecture um contribute to to caring or to to critical care in this and i i for a long time, um, together with Angelica Fitz, with whom I did this work on, 
on uh, critical care, um, architecture and urbanism for a broken planet, we used the word broken. And, and I have now shifted to, to thinking of the planet as, as wounded, because I think on one hand, it allows us to understand that the, the planet is ontologically vulnerable, so, so that the planet can be wounded. And on the other hand, I think that wound, woundedness um, also allows to think about what, what does it take for caretaking, healing, curing, and, and thinking about architecture in, in these terms, which is something to, that requires maybe unlearning other vocabulary. And this, I would join with this notion of interdependency, which I think is, is very apt to speak about, about architecture which in a way is always um, a material, not um, a materialization with, within interdependencies. Um, and, and books that are helpful to, to approach this, um, two of them are written by, by journalists, Elizabeth Colbert and David Wallace Wellis, um, deal with, with these dimensions of the anthropogenic uh, ruination. And the one in the middle is written, written by a scholar um, called Slow Violence and the Environmentalism of the Poor and Traces. And that relates a lot to the question of agency you asked before. Environmental movements um, in the global south, in particularly on the African continent, against overwhelming forces of extraction. But but that change actually is also forces of extraction. But but that change actually is also possible. And um, the entanglements of extraction, exploitation across bodies and so-called nature or resources, I think is something that is really important to understand the implicatedness of architecture in, in the production um, of um, continuity of life making and decreasing planetary destruction. And I, I will start with the destruction, um, with an example that was analyzed, shared by many journalists, scholars, um, and, and thinkers. And, and I borrow it from the book, How Women Can Save the Planet, written by Anne Karpf. And she looks at the um, collapse of um, the textile factories in, in Bangladesh, 2013, that were really widely, most widely reported. And, and so one could say that, of course, it's not the fault of the architecture um, that these textile factories collapsed and caused the death of many, um, mostly women, textile workers. But, but it's the lack of care or maintenance of these architectures. So I think one of the points I would try to make is that um, maintaining the existing architecture, how it's being taken care of, how it's not eroding, how it's not endangering life because of um, negligence, and lack of maintenance is maybe one of the very concrete um, points of architectural work. And one that within the profession um, is, let's say, considered minor. Um, reusing or maintenance or uh, investing into new ways of facility management. Um, are, it's, so the newness, I think, still holds a very strong paradigm. So that's why I wanted to start with, with this, to, to rethink, um, let's say, the ingenuity and importance of maintenance. And um, the second part of the story that uh, Anne Karp uh, really insists on is that the people, the women workers um, who came to find their death in these textile factories, actually came from villages because they are climate refugees, because their, their home villages um, are inundated by, by recurring floods. They, their prospect of becoming married um, decreases because their land is no longer usable in agricultural terms as before, or their homes were destroyed. And so in a way, the coming together of um, climate catastrophe and architecture in this example, I think, gives a lot to, to think about and to maybe learn from. 
And um, as, as we already introduced in our conversation, um, care as an approach to architecture is something that uh, Angelica Fitz and myself worked on, but also other um, practitioners, um, scholars uh, who seek to to reorient, let's say, the value system within architecture. So, so not um, not bigger, not more glamorous, not more iconic, uh, not more spectacular. So in a way, overcoming legacies of modernity, but also overcoming um, the impact of what iconic um, architecture, iconicity, um related to urban spectacularization and consumption has has caused and one of the authors um who has been very influential to to my thinking but also to the thinking of many others is the political theorist Joan Tronto and she has developed um an approach that considers um caring something that we have to understand from a democratic perspective, how care is being shared over lifetimes, um, how equity of care could or should be um, achieved. And there, I think, would be much more to be discussed how this relates back to notions of the welfare state or redistribution, which maybe can be more investigated in, in, in the discussion. I can't go deeply into that now. What I do want to share, though, is um, the framework that um, John Tronto, to get John Tronto, together with um, her late collaborator Berenice Fisher, has developed. And th these are steps that she uses to describe the care process when when people care in healthcare or in in domestic settings. Um, care about, care for, care giving, care receiving, and care caring with others. And I think that this framework can be very practically applied to architecture, both to the designing of architecture, so asking very concretely, what does my architecture care about? Um, how do I care for that? And how will this architecture be caregiving and also, how will it be care receiving? How can we plan? How can we use materials that are not, let's say, maintenance intensive or that that will not require a lot of um, labor to be cleaned every day? So, so I think there's a lot that one can very practically do with this. And there's also, I want to share... The definition um, of care that Toronto and Fisher developed back in 1990, because this is actually the definition that made me think of architecture as care. Um, so they describe that that uh, caring is um, a human species activity and, and it includes everything we do to maintain, continue and repair our world so we can live as well as possible. But it's actually the second sentence that made me think about architecture, that this world includes our bodies, ourselves and our environment. And this is exactly where architecture sits, between bodies and environment, but also keep connecting them in relations of um support, interdependency, um, sheltering, but also creating what has been called the built environment. So, so I think we can think with this sentence about architecture at many scales to see how, going back to the planet in danger, which Dorota introduced, to see how architecture can endanger the planet as it has built an environment that can be quite toxic and at the same time architecture is so much needed to um a discontinue building a toxic environment and at the same time providing protection to bodies that need to be sheltered that need to have a home that that need to have conditions of livability and, and life making. And of course, with the ongoing pandemic, with the war situations, with the climate displacements, this has all become even much more urgent um, than maybe before. 
architecture as critical care is the last part of, of what I'm sharing today. And um, so I'll skip some of the, <laughs> of the text. Maybe I was um, preparing too much, but um, I will go immediately to the examples that come from the book that was shown at the very beginning and that were shown in, in the architecture exhibition, Critical Care, Architecture for a Broken um, Planet. This is just to give you a view of what it looked like when it was installed in Berlin, uh, where it traveled to from Vienna. And maybe what's important to say is that all these um, 21 projects that were being um, shown here are all built projects. Um, there's, they are not utopian. Um, they, they all built within conditions of complexity, one can say. Um, conditions where there are difficult urban contexts um, where finances have to be found and secured. Uh, so, so, so in a way one could say, even though they are not business as usual, they are surrounded and within um, conditions that are created by so-called business as usual. So they are not um, outside of the mechanisms of globalized capitalism and they are not outside um, what is being defined by policies, by urban regulations, by zoning regulations, they operate within. And this is also something that John Toronto talks about that care always starts with and from the given. And I think that's a big difference from a modernist approach that started from the tabula rasa or the so-called green medal. Um, pretending that there wasn't anything there before, and then the better new architecture comes. And I think working within complexities with what is given in order to maintain relations and 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 produce um, what is needed, um, and a needs based approach is maybe also something that one could add as 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 defining architecture as care. Um, the first example has been widely published and, and many of you are probably familiar with it. Um, it's in um, the downtown of Sao Paulo in, in Brazil. And um, it was um, the headquarters of a um, um, department store. And this is the, the rooftop pool that was being added um, in this reuse of a 1950s building by Paulo Mendes da Rocha and MMBB architects. And it was built at a time when construction was actually low in Brazil, when there was um, um, a certain crisis. It was built with very modest means by really using the existing structure. Uh, it works with natural ventilation. Uh, a lot of the buildings that you see around this uh, structure uh, are actually squatted by people from the African continent, but also by, by people coming from other parts of Brazil. And there are not so many public interior spaces that, that you can actually use without passing through the threshold of a lot of security. And in this building, there is security, but, but it's nonetheless... Um, also with uh, the openness to the surroundings, creating um, hospitality. So a very ho hospitable interior space that made use of an existing structure that um, was built for SESC, um, which is the association of all industries um, that have to do with commerce that was founded in 1946 in Brazil. Uh, one may know this abbreviation SESC from SESC Pompeia, the building that uh, Lina Bobargi built. So that was the same client. SESC has like 40 different such SESCs um, in Sao Paulo alone. And they provide things that maybe in a European perspective are associated with welfare. So health, sports, culture, exhibitions, a very uh, affordable canteen. 
and and in a way also public space where you don't have to consume anything and i think this is a very large part of caring providing space where people don't have to spend money the second example um is um very different context a refugee camp um in the Satri village in Jordan um, was built by Emergency Architecture and Human Rights, which is an NGO. So also the, the way in which architecture offices are organized that were shown in this exhibition um, let us um, understand that one can, um, that, that there are different business models so that you can be, let's say, a more conventional office, but that you can be organized as a cooperative, that you can be organized as an NGO. Um, so in a way, I think this is also something that very often is missing from architecture education. What, what are actually the models of organizing one's business um, so that it can become a viable business, but but not necessarily correspond to the, um, the growth and progress centric ideas of capitalism. Um, the, the next example comes from uh, a Pakistani architect, um, Yasmin Lari. She's a little over 80 years old and um, is still um, practicing and um, has since 2004 since the, the big um, earthquake in Pakistan uh, worked on what is called emergency or relief architecture with international donors, but very often also very skeptical of the um, globalized aid industry, but nonetheless working um, with, with um, money that comes, for example, from uh, the International Organization of Migration or um, Japanese um, private companies uh, who were donors. And she, since she's retired, volunteers her own labor, but but she, she pays um, her small staff. And um, the material she uses is actually not only zero carbon, but almost at no cost because she she worked in areas along um, rivers where the mud can actually be generated for building in the villages and um, the bamboo has to be bought uh, but can be bought at a very um, low price and what she also initiated around these um, emergency shelters and um, we see here two examples of the zero carbon shelter initiative uh, and 40,000 of these shelters have uh, been built are local economies where she particularly works with um, providing education to women so that they can become uh, skilled artisans who can a build such homes but b also build uh, the tiles or the bricks or the materials so in a way generating local circular economies that invest in the livelihood so what i find very interesting here that her whole way of building is part of a very localized um economy that that um um, through building or rebuilding after earthquakes or floods not only creates homes but also forms of um, income. And here we see one of these teaching um, situations. She always speaks about creating a market where the poor um, offer things for the poor. Um, so, so she doesn't believe in gifts, but but in a way of um, what is still very often called empowerment, which is a complex and fraught term. But okay, so let's use the word empowerment at this moment for something where it talks about setting up economies within larger contexts of. Um, patriarchal feudalism and, and very um, complex uh, climatic conditions. And apart from the shelters, she has also developed um, uh, carbon zero um, stoves for cooking with raised platforms that, that these um, stoves, um, which are of course functional objects that are used for cooking, 
also offer a platform where women can, or women and their children can, can sit together and also have sociability. So I think for me, a large part of care is um, understanding needs um, as something that includes um, generosity and, and conviviality and hospitality, even in dire um, conditions. The last example I will share is um, an example in um, San Juan, Puerto Rico, and the image explains best what this is about. So in, in, in the foreground, we um, see the informal part of San Juan, which has been um, growing uh, since the 1930s, and all the land on which these houses stand um, doesn't belong to the owners of these houses. And in the background, um, we see the financial district, which is of course much younger than the informally grown uh, part of San Juan. And because of the uh, encroachment of the financial district, um, the pressure on the land increased because the value of the land uh, went up. And so a huge group of um, people, around uh, 700 people from these communities, um, with, and this group included community leaders, architects, urban planners, and the administration, they worked together in, in a, I don't think bottom up would be the right word, in, in a very transversal process um, with the tool of participation and, and consultation to establish, this is an aerial view of it, to establish um, a new law. So the outcome here was not a new building, but the architectural outcome was a new law that the entire land is now uh, owned by the communities through the mechanism of the community land trust, which takes the land out of the capitalist economy and, and therefore people cannot sell the land on which their house is, but at the same time, this is also a safeguard um, against uh, displacement, eviction, gentrification, and so on and so forth. And uh, they also published um, a number of books. So I'm sharing here the English translation, but the model immediately was taken up um, in the Brazilian favelas and also shows how this has become a transnational model of um, a legal precedence that has been taken up in, in other places and is a very, let's say, large scale uh, model. And I will, I will close with this slide that, that reads that for the first time, um, the residents were the actors of our future. And I think it's maybe the best answer to, to Dorota's question uh, around what gives um, agency, that, that the residents were the actors who, who were part of making not a global future, but their specific um, localized um, livable um, future. And also appreciating all the many, many hours of volunteer labor that had gone into the making of, of this law, the coming together, the discussing and, and um, um, openness to work together with uh, the administration. Um, so I will stop sharing here so that we can um, continue con conversing in a, in a different way. Uh, yeah, quite many questions now. Uh, you, you, you ended your presentation with an example of the uh, established law or using law as a, as a framework to, uh, to change the legal status of, of, of the land. And I think this is this uh, connects us uh, very strongly with the um, issue of ownership. And um, actually, we 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 did uh, a whole issue of our portrait on on this on this subject. Uh, and still, and on one hand, what it shows uh, it is what that one can uh, somehow extend in Poland. Now the ownership is like uh, really uh, a new a new god. So uh, you know, after the after the time of when we were deprived uh, like as a society of ownership now uh, now we have probably the mo 
most, uh, uh, I don't know, privately owned apartments and, and homes uh, after the, the uh, 1990s. So uh, the last 30 years were the years of the uh, really ruling of the, uh, of the ownership and, and the land being, uh, being established again as, as, a, uh, as a product, basically. And and uh, and this is uh, this is quite quite fascinating. And I came across similar initiatives, say in Berlin or or in um, a Granby Trust, I think, in in, in Great Britain. But uh, but it still it looks like a margin. And originally, when we think about law, everybody starts yawning, and it's not really interesting because the language is so difficult. And people don't want to get uh, involved too much in this. And 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 uh, in your one of your texts, you online an, an agenda for say um, future architecture studies, and you mention these new economies and also I guess new legal practices. Um, can you think about educating in these terms and 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 perhaps? Um, well, still, there's, there's this notion that it's a very small scale. You know, that there are cases like this, but they don't add up to like a broad picture because the broad picture is, is very different. So, so basically, the two questions were how to put it in the, say, cur curriculum for, for architecture and how to try to make it like more common than, than, uh, than it is. Than it is. Now, so many questions. Um, <laughs> Two, but long. <laughs> um, so, so I think the, I mean, ownership is is like one of the the mantras or the the building blocks. Maybe that's the better metaphor in this context of capitalism. I mean, how how something can be owned, how how we come as human beings. Um, to even think of the fact that something like land can be owned, I think that's that's so deeply ingrained in in into people who um, like like me grew up in in the former West, um, or or you described how this became such an um, aspiration um, in in the former East that um, the the pri I mean it's not that the land wasn't owned before it was owned by the state but that private ownership yeah. was something um, that needed to be achieved and I think your example illustrates how powerful legal imaginaries um, actually define relationships we have to to things or to living beings or to to how um, these relationships are then um, um, being understood. So, so just to say that I think the law is an extremely um, important field um, within the, the smaller field of architectural activism, um, let's say. But, but then on the other hand, I, th I mean, I'm just dreaming out loud now, but, but mm -hmm. like... Globally, in many countries, architects are organized in unions, in chambers, in 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 very um, established historical, long-standing bodies of of professional organization, and and they actually, I think, um, can or could use their voice in in lawmaking. So I guess in the past, um, this would very often have been the case in order to change building codes, where, where building codes were seen as the enemy that infringe on um, creativity or don't allow people to build in the way they like to build. But seems... now, now in Poland is the, the regulation of the pro uh, architectural profession. This is okay. Uh, this is a heated issue. Mm. Yeah, so so something like this, but I guess if we were to dream that that um, the the law could become an ally for climate change, for ensuring basic housing um, as a human right, um, 
then I think that it is an other way of approaching this and and also using these existing um entities as i don't know leverage or as as a louder political well maybe loud is not the the right metaphor as a mm -hmm. more insistent political um actor and how to put it into the curriculum I mean, I guess that's similar to the law question. So, so all these things have like global and international dimensions, and then they have very, it's still within the nation state. I mean, so, so laws and universities are still within certain configurations that, that are governed by, by nation states and the interests of the, the nation states and how you can change um universities or curricula um, has to do with how a university within a nation state is organized. Um, and, um, and also, I think what the expectation of the, um, and that's a very legal dimension, because you're not an architect after finishing architecture school, you still need to go this extra mile and having practiced or again this is organized differently in every country but it's not just the university that that gives you the legal um official right to stamp your plan and become an architect and i think between these two the university curriculum and what happens afterwards if there were more conversation around what it means to work with legal um frameworks um i think that's one that's one aspect i think the other aspect is as always transdisciplinarity how, how to organize that actually law students and architecture students um are being co-taught in in a seminar or in a studio even to practice together, to understand that, that there is actually something that they could do in order to change the condition, let's say, of a piece of land in Warsaw, if they wanted to. And, and I think um, I always try to, to think how one such example can inspire others. I understand the criticism or let's say the sober diagnosis you were given, giving that uh, 90% of the world still looks totally different. And the examples I've shown are the exception. And they um, also come from a certain part of globe. I, I know that not all of the examples in the book are, I, but but they, are, they come with uh, like probably more extreme conditions, more poverty than we in the Western so-called world mm -hmm. experience and so on and so on. Yeah. It, it doesn't agree. mean that it leaves. It doesn't mean that it leaves more space to act. Mm -hmm. uh, or I wouldn't claim that. Uh, but but uh, but still, like uh, you know, because because the the question my uh, my next question is also linked to this. That when you have these students that say uh, even are confronted with first reality of the uh, of the climate uh, crisis. Uh, which is not common in, in Poland. Uh, so even if they are confronted with this during their studies and they, I don't know, try to come up with uh, with uh, ideas or alternatives or even think about other economies, but then they face the reality of, sub, I don't know, joining a, other, an architectural office or joining or establishing their own practice later on. Uh, they have to provide for, I don't know, their families. They have to uh, maintain perhaps some of the workers and, 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 and all this uh, very practical issue. And then there's always this clash of, of, uh, of ideals and, uh, and, and the, the, say, neoliberal uh, <clears throat> reality. And, uh, well, what perhaps I would like to ask what 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 you say to students first of all, and how is is it possible if do they establish their own uh, ways of practicing the profession, mm -hmm. or what are the ways 
to uh, to practice the profession, let's say on the outskirts of the of the system, or you know try, sometimes ha hacking the systems. So of course, generally, I totally agree with you that the whole system should be changed. But if we wait for this, that then <laughs> you know <laughs> you know. It's, uh, uh, yeah, of course we can uh, in the meantime criticize, but still, you know, what what to say to people who actually chosen this uh, profession? I think that the the younger and youngest generation of practitioners who start um, working and organizing themselves coming out of architecture school, I guess many of them, as you describe. Um, work in an architect's office in an architect's office or in an architectural studio doing business as usual producing real estate or real estate exactly mm -hmm. but but i think then there are others who actually um invest a lot of creative energy and and thinking how to organize differently um how to resist the notion that as an architect you have to work 24 7 and cannot have a family so so starting also from the very personal um exploitation of of bodies and minds in 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 this work life um and um looking very critically at at who are clients i mean so become much more let's say um choosy for whom and with whom um, to build, um, looking specifically for clients with whom they want to work, um, invest in setting up networks. I mean, what I'm saying sounds maybe very general, but I think it's it's not so different from so-called business as usual. You always have to groom relationships with, with um, clients or you have to make your work known. And, and I would say, and this I see really as a difference to, let's say, people, my generation, that uh, the generation now, if I see it correctly, is maybe um, more attuned to, to using certain tools of um, communicating, networking, that, that may look very much like business as usual, but actually are put to use to produce outside of these parameters. And this I find a very hopeful um, and inspirational um, situation. Mm. I don't think it will ever be 100% of architecture students going that way. <laughs> Yeah, sure. Uh, perhaps we could come back to this notion of care, uh, because uh, first of all, you mentioned only this briefly, but but uh, perhaps we could talk a little bit more about what uh, happens to care work in global uh, in in capitalist society, and also you had this uh, this diagram of uh, John C. Tronto and Bernice Fisher uh, with this care for with. And perhaps we could come back also to this and uh, and elaborate more about when we address this or move it to the building. Mm -hmm. This is what you briefly outlined, but I think it is very interesting to to go in details into this uh, framework. I think the framework um, is is useful because uh, when one starts thinking about what does a building care about, like really concretely, does the building care about the weather? Does the building care about having um, large spaces for people? So, so does the building care about looking good? Um, so, so I think coming up with answers, what an existing building cares about and, and looking at that as broadly as possible um, is, is a good exercise to, to understand tensions between let's say representation and inhabitability or environmental impact and degradation and 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 human comfort um and the care for is in a way the way Toronto and Fisher have described it how you move practically from caring about something to caring 
to actually caring for something. So what are the resources you need? Um, what are the infrastructures you need? And I guess since I'm not a practicing architect, I, I have very much used it as an analytical tool. So looking at, at built architecture to understand what was needed to care for what this building cares about. So, so in a way, the, the conditions of labor that went into it or the conditions of production or the legal frameworks and, and how did they work together so that what architects cared about could actually become a reality. And I think the, the last two, the caregiving and the care receiving lo looks at both like architecture in between that architecture gives care, if you will, um, and maybe this has been thought more from a human-centered um, slash human-centric perspective um, rather than from an environmental um, dimension of what buildings do in the past. Now it's changing. Uh, but the, the care receiving, so how buildings actually need care um, and how they are being maintained and um, how those who are, let's say, the everyday. So in a way, we could say when, when, when you and I inhabit our apartments, we are the everyday caregivers for these apartments because we take very good care of them. Um, we try to fix things, we clean things. So, so in a way, it enlarges those who are producers of architecture when we work with this um, care framework. Um, and this is what I, in a way, like, like about it. And the caring with, which was added by Toronto in 2013, so much later, when she already developed her thinking toward um, caring democracy and, and what it takes to, to understand um, that um, caring labor, in her view, is something. So now I'm talking really about care workers, like domestic labor, mm -hmm. um, care workers who very often are immigrants. Um, in her context, it's the US, but I mean, the same holds true in so many different countries of the world that um, the so-called dirty work, um, domestic care, um, health care, but also we could say um, in relation to the building industry, the construction workers are very, very often um, extracted labor. And, and she argues that all these people should immediately be given citizenship because they are actually caring citizens that... Um, that build um, the foundations um, for these um, societies. And from this, she in a way develops this notion of caring with, so that um, care relations are always unequal. <clears throat> sometimes we need more care, sometimes we give more care, sometimes we can pay more for it, sometimes um, um, we cannot pay for it very much. But that in a democratic society, she, that's her argument, this would even out over time. And so I think there are many ways of thinking about this in relation to architecture. So, so how can architecture provide care to the 99% and not just to the 1%? How can um, care not, how, how can caring architecture not cause people to, to be in debt forever when, when they um, try to find housing? Um, how can the caring for a building be shared differently and not outsourced to some kind of strange cleaning company? Like, not strange, I shouldn't say that. That was not the right word. To um, globalized cleaning labor. Like, this happens in the universities where people work, in, in, in offices, that, that all this is outsourced and it's never even thought about that, you know, people who work in an office could also be the ones who clean this office. Um, and, and so I guess there's endless possibilities to, to think about how this framework can, can be used to understanding um, dimensions of care within architecture. I, I don't see it very narrow and limited to one thing. Actually, I see it as a proliferation of complexities of care that we can unfold with this and all yeah. this form. 
uh, I've read uh, even even today that uh, obviously the uh, the whole global society will grow older. So basically, uh, we have this narration of uh, say uh, techno optimists who <laughs> say that the labor, uh, some parts of labor in modern society, contemporary society will be taken on by, I don't know, algorithm or, or, or robots. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, all these new uh, inventions, uh, they are actually more, much more friendly towards younger generations than the older. So the, the growing exclusion, like digital exclusion is also, is also huge. And so what it means, and actually I wrote, uh, I uh, read a post about it in, on, uh, even on Facebook today, uh, that uh, uh, somebody who is uh, reflecting upon, uh, upon uh, cyber technology uh, said that actually we will probably in the future need more care work than we do today. And and this is this is something which we should con confront ourselves with first of all, but also uh, it uh, it somehow forces us to do what to to reflect upon what actually capitalism has done to the to the care work uh, to the care work itself in terms of how it is remunerated. You mentioned all the immigrants in Poland, for example, the Ukrainian ladies are, are, are cleaning and, and taking care of the elderly, not only after the war, but also uh, earlier on. And, uh, and obviously this is because this, uh, these jobs are not uh, well paid and they are not chosen for us. So similar with, I don't know, medics in the hospitals and things like this. Uh, as uh, of course uh, David Graber wrote in, in in bullshit jobs, so so this is this is again something with, which probably should be addressed poli politically very strongly, and uh, well and 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 then and then uh, well I don't think I have a good question, but I, I was wondering. Because we have to work on the uh, somehow changing the, the paradigm or, or the mindset, and how do you think whether it is happening and and how to contribute to to this to changing the realities of care work? Yeah, and the and the and the, per, like how we perceive also the care work because mm. you know the economic aspects tends to bring in the whole hierarchy of, of values. Mm. I mean, when Eco the economic values. Basically. Yeah, yeah. I mean, when the, so when the, the measure of uh, the GDP, the gross domestic product was first invented after the um, economic crisis in 1929, the, 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 there were actually the statisticians um, were actually discussing if they should um, uh, put in um, unpaid um, domestic work. Um, and then they decided that it was too much work to count it. So, so it wasn't that they weren't aware that this work has um, economic value, but I think it was a very, um, clear and um, strategic and very patriarchal decision to, to completely silence and thus annihilate um, the value of this work in economic terms. I mean, of course, they wouldn't have said like, this doesn't have value, but it didn't have value in economic terms. And I think this is one of the big conundrums for also anti-capitalist feminists, because on one hand, one would say, well, we, we don't want work to only be measured um, against money anyway. But then if a whole system is based on the equivalency to money, all the work that doesn't receive any money is completely um, deleted. Um, annihilated, uh, rendered inexistent. Um, 
And it's rendered inexistent in economic terms precisely because it cannot not be done. So, so I think this is in a way, um, and maybe that it could also be a connection to architecture. So, so we we will always need buildings, um, but but how we actually care for their coming into existence and their conditions of um, being produced um, is what comes before um, in order to to change. So, so I think in a way many of the things we discussed today have to do with one has to effectuate change in the ongoingness, but but at the same time, not give up to change those structures that actually condition the conditions or, or make the conditions the way um, in which um, they then are. And right now, I think I'm, I'm not an, I'm I'm really not optimistic when it comes to care work because um I think that that the experience of the um, and the consequences of the of the pandemic have uh, worsened um the conditions of um caring labor and have not um precisely the experience of the essentiality of care has in the terms of reality, not yet resulted in better conditions, quite on the contrary. Why do you think on the contrary? Uh, I think there are many reasons. So, uh, Because, because uh, what, what I've read during the analysis uh, in the pandemics that, for example, I don't know, the, the situation in Italy was uh, so bad at the beginning because they have a very limited number of beds because there were cuts and the, the, the system was made efficient. And that when it's when the system is efficient in terms of capitalist economy, it's also very easily breakable when, when a wave comes. So actually what I would uh, then think that, 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 that somebody could reflect upon this and, and perhaps... Uh, put more, uh, I don't know, uh, sort of, say, uh, resources to, to have mm -hmm. a, a system actually more adaptable in terms of uh, conditions that can be different. So why do you think it has worsened? Because this, I, 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 I mean, I, from what I experience, it's like, actually, we are coming back uh, and speeding up and trying to uh, uh, to somehow uh, chase the economics uh, we lost during the, the years of pandemics and the, and, and the destruction is, uh, is, uh, is probably even faster of, of also with war in Ukraine. But uh, do you think, but Pete, you mentioned care work, uh, that this is even worse. Why? Where do you see it? I think... So, so on one hand, a lot of people left the profession, mm -hmm. and and um, this speaks to the the really uh, endangering conditions that people found themselves in during the pandemic. Endangering in terms of infection, endangering in terms of exhaustion. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the responses to that was quitting. And I think it's not just the healthcare sector. In 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 many so-called service sectors, um, there is a lack of people who want to work in in these sectors. And so I think one of the consequences could be that the working conditions actually become worse. That that um, cheap labor is being sought um, from other places. So that sources of labor are being extracted under even worse conditions in mm -hmm. the future. And I think the other answer I have to this is has to do with the, the book I'm currently um, still finishing. And we talked about that um, a long time ago, um, how the rhetoric um, of um, declaring war against the virus actually um, on conscripted um, care. So there's something that I call militarized care essentialism, 
that um, while the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, or the WHO, the World World Health Organization, declared um, the world economy to be at standstill, which would very much continue the invisibilization narrative and, and the way in which uh, care work is devalued and not seen. Um, nation states um, introduced um, the term frontline to, to organize um, the, those workers who were not allowed to shelter in place and to stay at home. And the frontline is both a metaphor and not a metaphor. So the, so the frontline was used in metaphorical terms, but the frontline is also really a policy term and, and has long been a term in the economy for frontline workers. And they are the workers in direct contact with um, customers, other people. And, and so I think in terms of these public imaginaries um, of um, forceful um, conscription and the expectation of care or heroism, I think this, let, let's say in more, um, in, at the level of cultural and social imaginaries, how care is being thought of. I think this is very um, hurtful or harmful. And I'm, I'm not quite sure that, that coping with the pandemic and, and with wars, um, societies have found very good ways of dealing with these kinds of um, mass violence and, and mass trauma that, that is inscribed into the conditions of life. So, so, I, this, so this is an other answer to your question that, that I think that different answers. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, the, the question was, uh, behind the question, there was the, the situation that actually my, my uh, husband, uh, uh, doctor, he's a cardiologist who worked in the COVID war. And I don't know from his experience that the people were quitting, for example. So uh, it doesn't mean that the situation is better, but, uh, but at least the uh, uh, cardiology department, it looks not worse. Although, uh, of course, but this is more general, uh, there is uh, a huge uh, lack of, of, uh, of nurse and medics because there was not, it was not an a path of career for many years. The schools were closed and so on. So it's becoming now probably there are there, there are more schools opening now, but there is a gap. So the average age of the nurse in, 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 in Poland is around 55 from what I know or 60. So so really there is a there is a huge gap. But perhaps at the end if you're just last question because the end <laughs> Uh, it's uh, it's already over an hour that we talk. Uh, I would like to ask you about the idea of the architecture for the 99% and so what it means and who is it for, like for the 99%, I guess, but uh, how to practice it again. I think it's a very old idea, just with new words. Um, so, so the in the past it may have been called uh, minimum. We, we are the, we are the ninety nine percent also. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it's an idea that is, in a way, oscillating between human rights in nineteen forty eight. Um, part of human rights at the assistance of Eleanor Roosevelt was actually the access to, to housing and, and education and, and the things that are needed for, for everyday life. And, and these are called a human right. And, and who then ensures that this human right um, becomes um, a lived reality and how, how is, um, and again, this is a question of law and architecture and economy coming together. And I think the other idea would be to think about um, notions of, um, I mean, the notion of a basic income. What, what would that be in terms of basic housing that, that has to be there um, for everyone? 
so it's so making architecture affordable um accessible um maybe the best word would be making architecture possible for for the 99 percent that 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 architecture that is there for for all the people who need to be housed doesn't continue to ruin the planet but but at the same time doesn't re-inscribe the um, infrastructures of inequity that that have been created by by the division between uh, what is called formal and informal um in 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 the past so so i think one way would be to to see architecture as a basic infrastructure that 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 people need for um continued living and surviving oh, all right I, I was just wondering uh, if there are any questions, but there are no, no questions on, on YouTube. So, uh, uh, I could perhaps just like to, to close, just to close up, I was really touched uh, about what you said at the beginning of our conversation before we, we started the, the, <laughs> the live uh, uh, transmission. Uh, basically, um, uh, what you said, how care also influences or I mean it's connected to attachment and how it's um, like the, the um, recipro reciprocal, uh, mm -hmm. I'm correct. Could you just, perhaps we will close on this very sort of in a way uh, emotional tone, but somehow I think it's very human and, and somehow it's it's also at least for me, it's it it's brings also hope and and uh, yes, and I, I see you said the, the feeling of agency in a way. Yeah, so we had a private conversation, Dorota Marta and myself, before the public conversation started, and 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 in a way, we were sharing with each other what it is that that um, despite all the reasons to actually. Uh, um give up be depressed um give in to these um conditions that are very um dystopian and and disruptive and saddening um how we find hope in in our daily lives and and then i or optimism even and then i asked marta what gives her hope and she said her cats and and from this we were moving to how care establishes relations to subjects we are attached to, but who are also attached to us. And in a way, the in the cat human relation, it's not just the human that that gives care and the cat that receives care. But but there is also a reciprocity, and the reciprocity is not about sameness. I think that's the important thing to learn. But the reciprocity is is about um, responding and and giving things at one's own terms, but also understanding the other at the same time. And I think in this very complicated, there's never an equilibrium, but but there is always this. Um, back and forth um between care giving and and care receiving that that through the attachment can maybe looked at differently from only an analysis of power and we were also talking about how these attachments are formed within existing infrastructures of inequity so so that actually acknowledging the not so perfect and 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 actually ruinous conditions can still um, allow for hope making. So so in a way, not taking hope for granted, but making hope. But then, Dorota, you didn't share with us how you how <laughs> you actually generate um, not giving up um, writing, um, producing was... journal, and 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 actually giving so much to a community of architecture. So maybe before we close, you also want to share that. 
well, I was afraid that you're going to bring this up. And no, I was thinking uh, something else. And what, you know, when the war started, mm. there was this huge wave of compassion and, and engagement. And also, so the way, uh, the way with coping with fear and worry was actually to, uh, similar with pandemics, to, to try to be active, to, uh, uh, to somehow influence uh, or, or change uh, someone's situation for the better and this was also partly my, my experience but then later on you know you turn you somehow uh, as in activism as well climate activism you get worn up you, uh, you, you worn out so you are not uh, you cannot ma maintain the same level of involvement for for a longer time and um, but then you have to mobilize, and there was the, the, there was this this um, tension uh, I wanted to bring in, and it's also I think very present and inscribed in care work itself. That that you know that that it, that in caregiving, of course, you're getting a lot, but you're also wearing yourself out, and then you have to again somehow collect it collect yourself to pieces to continue and 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 I wanted just to add this up uh, but but in terms of our I don't know activities in our portrait it's about uh, you know always trying to look uh, perhaps uh, the, 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 this, mm, this position of of course facing the reality but uh, and reflecting upon it but on the other hand trying to to gather forces to somehow um, prevent the worst or looking for ways out perhaps somehow contributing to, to a possible change if if, if one if it comes <laughs> yeah so, so that was that was something i i, uh, I wanted to share but perhaps you 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 could also comment about this. Uh, oh, there is a picture. <laughs> there is a question. I'm sorry. Uh, so uh, I feel like architecture of care aligns with principles of solar park, pa punk movement. But solar punk is an utopian movement. And I'm curious, why not propose the utopia or working towards it? Solar park punk movement can you I, I don't think I'm the right person to <laughs> ask about this <laughs> and there is there is a forward to the, follow up to this question why constraint itself with the capitalist mode when it clearly is at odds with sustainability and providing for people's needs I think we talked about this but we, I don't know exactly as well what the, what the solar punk movement so next time we have to uh invite things of Kaminsky to talk to us, I think. Uh, well. So uh, uh, do you think that you would like to address the swearing out uh, question or, or notion, or shall we just say that we were know itself out <laughs> tonight and, and thank everybody? I think acknowledging that one can be worn out um, and and taking time for recovery and and recuperation, but then understanding that one can also continue so so that be, one is not worn out forever. So so I think um, and there is also capitalism which is taking up the, you know the self care issue very mm. strongly. So. There's also a danger of falling into this trap of self-care, mindfulness, and, and, and stuff like this, probably. Yeah. Next discussion. Yeah, OK. Thank you very much, Alka. It was a great you. pleasure. Thank you. And I uh, wish you a, a good recovery, because Alka yes, had to recently you. COVID. Yeah, so we take, are- uh, Take best of care. <laughs> Thank you, and thank you to Dominique who was with us and helping with the technical issues, and thank you to all of you who watched. And, and see you at the exhibitions, 
and uh, exhibition in, in Warsaw. And please follow the other upcoming uh, events because it's quite packed and it's a very interesting program. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>